Da, 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 da. I woke up this morning. Ba, ma, 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 ma. All my Gmail was gone. Ba, ba, ma, ma, ma. <laughs> I called my friend's father, Carl. Ba, ba, ma, ma, ma. He said, get Patrick and Dwayne on. Ba, ba, ma, ma, ma. <laughs> it's pretty much what happened. A true story. A true story. <laughs> I don't know so- if it'll top the charts. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, Patrick. Hey, Carl. How are you doing? Good. Dwayne? I am fantastic. How are you? Awesome. You're soon to be buried in snow. Yes. Yeah. Snowmageddon is coming. Snowmageddon. The reason I uh, sang that little blues song in the beginning is because this actually happened. A friend of my daughter's um, sent me a message a little while ago and said, oh my God, all my Gmail is gone. And uh, I, the first thought I had was, Oh, geez, the Russians are at it again. <laughs> Not today, Russia. Not today. Uh, <laughs> that is such a great YouTube. But yeah, we're we're helping her work through it. I think and, she's uh, made progress. I think we did it. You know, she's, in a, she's certainly in a better place than she was security-wise before we started talking. Anyway, it's a scary prospect. I mean, you just mentioned to anybody, hey, what would you do if you woke up one morning and all your Gmail and everything on Drive was just vanished and people just will freak out like you know oh my god everything i own is on google drive or whatever could you know dropbox insert here but yeah. you know when you rely on these cloud services and you put everything that you own up there so that you don't have to keep them on hard drives or whatever well, eh, it's pretty scary you can only be betrayed by those things that you trust patrick you are a font of wisdom right <laughs> and and horrifying sayings You should get that stitched onto a pillow. You can only be betrayed by the people you trust. (laughs) At least I don't laugh gleefully when the internet is burning. That's why I don't trust anybody. (laughs) You shouldn't either. My mother called me that once. Uh, Once. (laughs) Once. All right. So there are some stories here. As there are every week, we we can't stop them. They keep happening. Let's start with uh, Linux. Let's start with Linux. This is probably the the biggest issue this week. Yes. Ish. Okay. It's not as big as Log4j because it doesn't give you instant remote access. Nothing's as big as Log4j. Nothing. <laughs> um, however, uh, this one's interesting. So for those of you who, who are not up and on the know of PwnKit, uh, PwnKit is a, is a, you know, Log4j is actually a logging library, and the exploit is log for shells. Um, that's what people call it. So in this case, in Linux, for those of you who are administered Linux servers and workstations before, you know there's this pull kit, um, which is in essence a PK execute. Um, executable that gives you the ability to Don't run. Don't even know what that is. Yeah, uh, let me... All it is is it's a an automated process that runs yeah. in the background on Linux on every distribution for 12 years. Okay. That gives you the ability to run as an elevated user. It's kind of like uh, sudo edit or um, sudo or whatever for those of it you. It sounds whatever. super convenient. Or if, yeah. It is super convenient. <laughs> so let's say you needed to do something on the system in an elevated privilege. You could schedule to have this particular executable run it. And that's cool. It's um, like in Windows, if you right-click on a, a link and you say run as administrator. Exactly. And in this particular case, uh, the the poll kit, um, Qualsys, I think it was Qualsys. Yes, Qualsys. Qualys? Qualys. No, Qualys. Wow, I've okay. read that wrong. That's the dyslexia kicking in. Qualys. <laughs> um, I actually discovered, interestingly enough, about nine years ago, um, there was a change to this distro for PollKit um, to uh, actually introduce. There was a small bug introduced. So what happens now? Nine years ago? I thought nine it was years twelve. Ago. I it was uh, 12 might have years been. Ago. They say as much as twelve years ago, but they can definitely track it down in nine so years. So if you're so listening far. to this in three years, it'll be twelve years ago. There you go. <laughs> it's between twelve and nine years. A long, long time ago. In an a eternity Linux distro in far Linux away. World. Right. Right. Um, so what's neat about this one is it requires nothing be introduced on the system. 
Um, all you need to do is run one small command and you go from a normal user on a Linux box to full root administrator. Okay, so let's stop there for a second to, to just clarify this. So there's two primary parts of a hack. Mm -hmm. and, and this is gross oversimplification. There's getting a foothold on the system, remote access, and then there's escalation of privilege. This is the second part. This reminds me of the underwear gnomes. Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> From South Park? Yes, yes. But that's true. Am I missing a, a stage? I don't know. No, so. no. It's, yeah, it's... Uh, it's, you know, first step is you have to get access. And Log4j provided that. Yeah, and a lot of times Log4j would provide elevated privileges. But if it didn't, this exploit right now, you could run on almost any Linux system on the planet and go from a normal user to an administrative user, which is awesome. So given that it's come out two months after Log4j is very bad timing for Linux. And it is super easy to exploit. Like hmm. what's what's funny about the, the Qualys uh, team is they, they said, hey, listen, we're not going to release a POC. We're not going to do it right now because it hasn't been patched yet. Okay. But what we are going to do is we're going to just explain <laughs> a little bit about what it is. And then they went into gory detail mm. about missing environment variables and blah, blah, blah. And you go, oh, okay. Yeah. you Dwayne, just full disclosure, Dwayne created a, a, an exploit from their murky descriptions right after they described it. Right. And then mm. everybody on Twitter is like, wow, this is really easy. It's like 15 lines of code for me to then yeah. exploit an entire system. And yeah. So they're saying they're not releasing it, but it's already out there. Um, I And wow. within like 12 to 14 hours, they release their POC. So there's the, the, if you look for a POC for PwnKit right now, you will find tons of them out there. And, and security researchers right now are making them even easier to use. Like it used to be, oh, well, you needed two pieces of C++ code that you compiled and run, and that then mm. worked. And then one person said, well, let's compile it in one code. And another person said, let's compile it this way. And another person said, hey, I did it in this one liner that pulls the C++ code from a website and compiles yeah. it, makes it super easy. So now it's just a one liner. It's super easy to get. All right. So system. is there a patch yet? Um, so the patch is forthcoming. Um, actually, oddly enough, this is super simple to um, mitigate Prevent. temporarily. So this okay. is, I guess, the point of this is if you're dealing with, uh, if you're administering Linux servers anywhere at all, mm. any distro, and it is running uh, pull kits PK execute, um, all you really need to do is modify the execution privileges to 0755 instead of 0777. So instead of allowing everybody on the box to run PK execute, only allow administrators and you're done. Like so it, it Jordy LaForge would be uncoupling the Heisenberg compensators. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, I mean, there's a lot. So Data like, would be pulling out all those crystals and yeah. realigning them. Even, even the name Pone Kit is only going to make sense to certain classes of people. Yes. Uh, you know, video gaming, when we st were playing Doom and Quake, if you owned someone, you, you destroyed them and it became Pwned with the P right. instead of no. And so now a lot of the kits are pwn this and pwn that, um, in the, in the elite speak of these, yes. these young whippersnappers who are now 40. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so question here, it, if you have the Linux subsystem for windows or the bash shell in windows, are you vulnerable? No, no. Cause it, it doesn't run the same subsystem. It's like it's like saying, like, um, if you were to run Wine on Linux, which Wine is a thing that allows you to run Windows applications, right. would you still be susceptible to a Windows update bug? No, probably okay. not. Um, not same subsystem. You could right. run the same commands, but yeah, you're probably good if you're running a Windows box. All right. It's only the, the first the, the time long ever. beard. Yeah. You next guys. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right? Microsoft gets a break this week. <laughs> Our number yeah. one downloaded show is uh, Microsoft, a bad week for Microsoft or whatever. Oh, really? Called, but, oh, there you, know. you go. See, yeah. lots of people like to see Microsoft. I think it's just because of who follows us, you know, yeah. well, Microsoft yeah. programmers. Yeah. Although but I, we want to change that. Yeah. So we, we want you listeners to use your vast social networks to get out the word about security this week. Send it to people. Send it to your grandmother. <laughs> She'll have a good laugh. It's, you know, it's for mere mortals. Three so crazy old share guys. it. Yeah. Yeah. Let's get these numbers up. So, so if we go back to our, our formula, 
Yeah. How do you know if you have this? Well, if you have a, a Linux server that's not 12 years old, you mm-hmm. got a problem. Um, how do you, what do you do about it? You change the permissions on that executable and you yeah. patch as soon as the patch comes out. That's that, that's the two bullets that we want people to know. Okay. And so the next story is related. You said Dwayne. Yeah. The next story is related. Um, so we had, I had two links in here. I had the, the initial pwn kit dot text explanation. So listen, as a, as a super duper challenge for those of you out there who love writing code, you could read the first link we put out, which is a pwnkit.txt from, from Qualys, um, and see if you can create your own exploit, um, because it's not so hard. Um, and then this, the second link is actually just a news article from Bleeping Computer talking about it. Oh, okay. So there you go. It's like a little, it's a little challenge, a little capture the flag type thing. Attackers now actively targeting critical sonic wall RCE bug. Ah, uh, that's our next one. So the next one. Oh, wait one, a minute. So. Yeah. I, there were so two I links missed, for the other one. There, there were two, two links. Stories. They're just, oh, yeah. They look like one I see. Link. But that top one's actually the explanation from, from Qualys. That was an example of uh, Dwayne fishing you, Carl. I was. <laughs> All right. So just so you know that the text file is going to be third in the list. There okay. you go. It's just because that's how we, we roll. That's how we do the things. We All do. right. So Sonic Wall. Um, Sonic Wall. Oh, and uh, you'll notice a lot of times we talk about while we go back to this Linux bug, um, a lot of times we talk about this being a priv-esque, privilege escalation, where we escalate. Um, another right. terminology we use in the field is LPE, local privilege escalation. So just, yeah. they're the same thing. So Okay. You know, for all of you who are really itching to read the gory details on this. For those of you that aren't, tell your Unix guy to go fix it. Or to do something else. Right. Or to, or to, or to do go do something else. I thought you were going to go do this. <laughs> Tell your Linux guy to install Windows. Oh. oh. Yeah, let's let's see how well they take that. We just lost 100 subscribers. <laughs> <laughs> or otherwise half. <laughs> hey, hey, for all of them who know what I do, yeah, Linux is uh kind of kind of my main operating system at this point. Yeah. yeah it's pretty awesome. And yeah. Cheap. Yeah, although, you know, Microsoft's doing a really good job at um, allowing hackers to put more hackity hack platforms on there so that Windows is a, a, a good operating system for it as well. It's like iPhone. I mean, iPhone used to be it's like, yeah, Apple's got a phone. A- Apple's got the best phone platform. I would rather go after an, an Android than have to go after an iPhone. Oh, yeah. At this point. And, yeah. and Windows is, has definitely, you know, it's, it has its bad days and it has its bad weeks, but so does Linux. And right. so does Mac. Well, you know, Microsoft isn't necessarily not in our list of stories this week. And that's a little foreshadowing for what's there to come, go. kids. All right, let's talk about Sonic Wall. Foreshadow. Sonic Wall. Um, so Sonic Wall, this one will be relatively quick. Um, but uh just another note for patching. Every week we come out with something that's uh, hey, you should stop what you're doing right now, pause this podcast. If you own this particular device, go patch it right now and then right. click resume. Probably shouldn't wait. And this is the same thing with this Sonic Wall thing. This is a Sonic Wall critical bug, uh, critical se- severity vulnerability impacting Sonic Wall secure mobile access gateways. So if you are running a Sonic Wall secure mobile access gateway, right now there is a remote code, unauthenticated remote code execution. So unauth RCE. What that means is you do not need a username and password for the gateway to exploit it and have it run whatever code you want. Hmm. Um, Oddly enough, it says that the code will then be running under nobody, which is weird because that's an actual user. (laughs) There's a user named nobody. (laughs) Yeah, the Beatles sang about him. Yeah, that's true. Oh, no, that was nowhere. (laughs) <laughs> no. That might be where he lives. <laughs> There's a Laura Branigan song or something like that. All right. Well, anyway. Yeah. Um, so, <laughs> the, this, uh, so here's a question. Yes. You, you know, you said if you're running this Sonic Wall thing, yes. is there a situation in which somebody would be dependent on this that they wouldn't know they were running it? No. Like, is it something that's embedded in a Wi Fi well, network or something? So, so I guess here's the question. Um, Everyone doesn't know what kind of firewall they have. Yes. Mm. Everyone doesn't know won't know what kind of wireless networking they have. Right. Everyone doesn't know what kind of engine or fuel injection system or braking system they have. 
if you're the kind of person who you run a business and you have an MSP or you have someone else. MSP? Managed service provider. You're offloading the IT to somebody else. Yeah. They're doing this on your behalf. And it, if, they're, if they're good and they're, they'll, and they're using SonicWall, then they're patching it. If yeah. they're not so good, which, you know, half of them are above average and half of them are below average. That's the way the world works. Yeah. Um, then they won't realize there's a problem. And it'd be good if you called them up and said, hey, if we're using SonicWall, did you apply the patch? Be now, a nudge. No, yeah, exactly. As the Yiddish, <laughs> in, in, the, in the Yiddish. Let me say this. About once a year, sometimes more often, we reevaluate our firewalls. Hmm. And it isn't because firewalls, you know, just suddenly become bad. It's because there's le- industry leaders and there's industry laggards, and those places change. We always want to use best of breed. That said, we could pick a new firewall, implement it, spend a lot of money to do it, and then it has this kind of problem a week later. It's mm-hmm. kind of like telling people, well, you know, what's the best stock to buy? Well, this one's doing well last week, but it might tank next week. What you want to do is pick a, a system that protects you, um, Fortinet, Fortigate, SonicWall, whatever, Cisco, and you want to keep it up to date and keep it in your mind, keep it in your background so you know when there's a problem because there are always going to be problems. Yeah. And then you want to evaluate that it hasn't fallen into disrepair. Same as antivirus, same as everything else. So just because Sonic Walls in our news doesn't mean it's it they're they're junk and you should abandon them. What what you should do is understand what you're using for this stuff so when it comes out you can go and patch it. Yeah, okay. All right. Well, good enough. Uh guys, I think it's time for our moment of long for J. <laughs> Yeah, the it's the gift that keeps on giving. Log for J attacks, log for shelves. So what's interesting about this is um, there's uh, some uh, some new data coming out. Um, actually, I don't know if you guys follow this guy on Twitter, but if you do not, uh, Kevin Beaumont, uh, Goss the Dog. So at Goss the Dog, great information from him. But um, you know he he started talking about how Log4j, you can use the log for shells to exploit VMware Horizon. We've been t- we talked about that last week, where we said, you know, if you have a VR- VMware Horizon system that's accessible by the inter- on the internet and it hasn't been patched, then sure enough, you could be susceptible to log4j, uh, log4j attack, and the attackers can run whatever they want. Well, what do you do at that point as an attacker, right? Um, do you go and put a whole bunch of Bitcoin miners on your network? Probably not. You probably want persistent access to that network. The mm-hmm. best way to get persistent access is to put a shell on the network, something that's going to call back to you so that you can then go on, get on that network anytime you want. A shell is a remote command line. Thank you. So basically, if I if, if Dwayne pops a shell on your system, he now has a command line at his computer that controls your computer oh, that you don't know anything shells. about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> pop yes. some tags. Pop. <laughs> we, should do, we should do a parody of pop some tags with pop some shells. Oh, pop some shells. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so what's what's interesting about this is um he says hey listen be careful because if your systems have been exploited by log4j um like exploited by log4 shells over the log4j library in the past what attackers are now doing is they're actually modifying native files in vmware horizon to spin up shells that way so you may Whoa. not see the new files because they actually go into, and I think he, he references in his uh, one of his tweets, um, he references one of the files, uh, the absg-worker.js file. Um, mm. Just, hey, know that these these files come with VMware Horizon and they could get modified to actually spin up a shell. Um, so, you, so just realize if your box has been compromised, you really do want to go with a fine tooth. Uh, forensically through those boxes and make sure they're mm-hmm. still not even after you patch. Mm, okay, that's our latest log for J. But not our last. Not our last. And oh. that was our moment of log for J. <laughs> <laughs> but we have a couple more stories. Not just it's not all about log for J. No, is it? no, it's not all about log for J. And and we did talk about you know interestingly enough a couple weeks ago we had talked about the FTC. Right. Um, potentially suing companies over lost data in this Log4j, Log4shells fiasco. Right. Um, so for those of you who haven't seen that or listened to that episode, shame on you. 
Um, but for those of you who have, you know, we're talking about, you know, if you if you had a system that was susceptible to log4j and you lost user data, mm -hmm. um, now the FTC is saying, hey, you know what, we may actually sue you for lost damages um, because somebody has to protect these users who now you've lost their data. Well, this is New York's attorney general went after these guys. I med. I med. Yeah. I med. So I med is an Ohio based healthcare provider that's been fined $600,000 over a data breach that exposed the records of 2.1 million patients across America. So this is the definition of insult to injury. Yeah. Because not only did they suffer the breach, which hurt their brand and is costing them money internally to remediate and deal with, but now they have a fine on top of it. And this is the government ratcheting down to make it more and more painful so that companies actually do do deal. The things that they could have done to prevent this are common sense and well-established. There's no so, magic here. What's interesting to me is that this is an Ohio-based healthcare provider, yet the New York Attorney General is suing them. Does that open them up to lawsuits from other states? Any place they did business, any place whose citizens um, were affected. Uh, uh, oh my God. Yeah. So uh, we're here. entering that phase. We talked. We've been talking about this for months. Yeah, but we're we never have a... We haven't had an actual case and this is the first i've heard of yeah these uh, these, and we'll start to see a lot more of these i mean this one i don't know that this one actually um they're still are they did they track this down to a log 4 j breach or was this just fines. a breach they've yeah. been fines in the past but usually the fines are along the lines of there was specific guidance of hipaa that you didn't follow uh, the hipaa hipaa you know this is now generic there's no specific law like hipaa hipaa I'm calling it like a, my Boston accent's coming out, HIPAA. Um, it's, um, this is more of, you didn't fall, it's negligence. You didn't follow what's, what everyone knows should be common pra common practices. Well, now right. every company in the, in the world should be panicking to go and actually get serious about security. And, and you should be listening to our damn show. Exactly. If they were just listening, somebody would have said, hey. Well, there was, there was a motion, there was a movement at one point for, Every company to have someone on their board, every company, public company in the United States to have someone on their board who had um, cyber experience mm. or for them to demonstrate where they were getting that ad, ad, that advice from and it didn't yeah. turn into a bill. But I think we're going to see more and more of this because everybody's just getting sick of it. We're all getting sick of the ransomwares, the um, the breaches, and, and then just the incompetence. Like they're they're, they're ostriches. They're hiding their head in the sand. This is password management and two-factor authentication. None of this stuff is should be news to anybody. Okay, rant over. <laughs> I'm off my soapbox. All right, so um, there's got to be a Russian story here somewhere. Yes, there is. There is always a Russian story, yeah? Always Russian story. Always Russian. Russians are good. Uh, APT29. Yes, so Russian APT twenty nine. I, you know, I always wonder. It's always tough. How do you, how do, how do they, how do they give them the number? Is this a hacker group? Who discovers them first? Yeah. So APT, for those of you who may not know, is just an advanced persistent threat. Um. So oh, okay. APT is a a nation state equivalent, either a country with a cyber army that's attacking, or some very well funded, um, you know, organization that that has an offensive cyber team. That yeah. works for a government. Yeah, that typically works for a government. Um, that's well, APT. If they don't work for a government, then they're probably hacktivists or a criminal syndicate. Sure. So those okay. are the only three categories, I think. Um, All right. But, so what's the news? So this and so this is interesting. You know, most of these APT names are really hard to to remember. Twenty nine versus twenty seven versus twenty eight mm -hmm. or whatever. CrowdStrike typically gives them um, actual names. So this one is actually Cozy Bear. So you, you guys, we've oh, all heard of them. Cozy, cozy bear. bear. I know cozy bear. Not like fuzzy bear, but cozy bear. <laughs> cozy bear is it's lovely. <laughs> it's like nice. a warm hug from a bottle of vodka. <laughs> there go the rest of our subscribers, man. I'm sorry. I apologize for the fake Russian accent. I'm I'm a middle aged white guy. You know, I I don't blame you if you flood us with email and tweets saying that you know whatever. <laughs> just it's just a joke it's a bad joke a and i'm bad, sorry a bad I joke. lord i apologize <laughs> my 
my wife always <laughs> tells me she's like listen you can't do accents of anybody you just no, you you sound can't. horrible you got to stop I'm like oh um so this uh this one is warning we always talk here about and i won't go too much into the details here this is a, a report that was released to bleeping computer from crowdstrike actually on okay. uh particular type of attack that's attacking people's Office 365 and attempting and sometimes succeeding in bypassing MFA, which is the multi-factor authentication. Okay. Um, so the reason I wanted to bring this article up is this, and this one's really complicated, so we're not going to go too deep into it. It involves like credential hopping and hijacking and all sorts of other stuff. Um, but the advice to the, the sort of normal user is we constantly hear say, Use MFA, use multi-factor authentication. Yeah. If, if PayPal can text you the, you know, some secure code that you can then type in, do that. If it, if Google Authenticator um, is used every time you log into a, a particular website, turn it on. Right? Authenticators there's, are really good. Yeah, there's no reason not to have them. And, and, and then you read the news like this where they go, oh my gosh, Russia just bypassed MFA, right? Does that make it all garbage? And, and it doesn't, right? The, the advice still stands. Well, let's talk about that for a second. So there's different flavors of multi-factor authentication. So yes. let's talk about this for a minute. There's one flavor is the one that most people think of is you go to your bank, you try to log in, it sends you a code, a text message to your phone, and you put that code in. And now the bank feels that they've authenticated not only that you know the password to the web and the, the username and password to the site, but that you have the phone device belonging right. to the owner. Now, right. here's the rub. If I can get your username and password and I can convince the phone company to do a SIM replication, a SIM swap with me, I can have a copy of your phone. And in doing so, now um, by hacking the phone vendor – which is not trivial, but it's possible, I can get through that second factor authentication. And that's what we're seeing a lot of the time. Now, another way to do this is to send an email to the person with an, at an email address that they have that, right. that we know they control. But the same thing applies. If I can get your username and password for your banking, I probably can get your username and password for your email. Would you say, Patrick, that the risk of an attack goes down when you use multi-factor authentication. It does because it's an additional hoop. But yeah. let's talk about what would be even better. There are other authenticators that you can get. There are authenticator apps that you can use and other mechanisms of multi-factor authentication that take it out. That can't be, well, Dwayne, Google Authenticator is one. Uh, what are some of the other Microsoft ones? Microsoft has one for Azure. Yeah, RSA. I actually really like Microsoft's. Um, yeah. There's RSA uh, authenticators. There's all sorts of authenticators out there. Here's the thing. If somebody has your phone SIM and they have your Google password, they could download and install the authenticator and Bob's your uncle. So yes and no. If they have the phone SIM, they they could get a text with the – like if you say, hey, text me. Um, but if they have your phone SIM and then try and download the authenticator, the authenticator is going to be unique on that phone. And that's okay. actually a concern, too. you got to be careful when you download these authenticators and then let's say you update to a new iPhone or a new right. Android phone or whatever. Make sure you copy down or export your keys for those um, that authenticator to the new phone because if not, I, the new phone won't have access. You know, to Grandma them. Franklin wouldn't even know what you meant no. by download the keys. Who knows that? I mean – what does that mean? It, it's the guy. The, the guys at the Apple Store. No, it's um in, okay. in most of these app in most of these authenticators. Before you pitch the old phone, just make sure that in the in the settings you can say, "I want to transfer this to a new yep. new location." Okay. But if the phone that is makes destroyed, it, makes it uh, then life is difficult. Yeah, there are ways around that too. Um, like I use uh one. We've talked about this before. Password managers. I use one password. Password yeah, I, I do that too. also does authentication. So yep. I can use that as my MFA. Um, it has it does the rolling tick just like Google Authenticator does, and then they keep that up in the cloud for me. So so what would you do if your phone got stolen and you don't have a code? Uh, well, Patrick would say he'd just have the drone drop the bomb on it, but. <laughs> I just detonate the charge that I've already installed right? in the phone. <laughs> wow, it's, his phone has hey. this big brick of clay on the back. <laughs> it's hissing. What does that mean? <laughs> Boom! Oh my God. Like a Maxwell Smart movie. <laughs> oh, Carl, I've managed to get rid of the hiss. 
<laughs> it's just gonna go bang. Yeah, only the first versions had the hiss. So, <laughs> oh, evil! Actually, evil, evil. it rings, so they put it next to their head, and oh, then there you oh, go. Oh, there you go. <laughs> and it's a shaped charge, Patrick. Now we've oh, lost yeah. all of our younger listeners. More career advice. <laughs> hey, if they've watched the blacklist, they're still with us. Uh, yeah. yeah, or yeah, Game fantastic. of Thrones. Um. All right, but seriously, what would you do if somebody, if you had a phone, if somebody yes. you know has a phone, it gets stolen, and there's no security on the phone? What do you do? You've got uh, a big problem, don't you? Yeah, I mean, at that point, you have a big problem. If there's no security on the phone, like no pin, no lock, no anything, you just turn it on and use it. I, I suppose you can go to the phone vendor, like you know, if it's a sure. AT and T or whatever, and say well, whoever you have the phone to, you know, lock this phone, or maybe there's a, a feature that you can do that. With iPhones, if it's a, perhaps. So, no, I'll if tell you, it's a I'll business tell you, phone, you know what I would do? You can brick it. So listen, yeah. I- iPhone, you can't you can't register a new iPhone without having an, I- an Apple account, without having an, an iTunes iCloud account. Yes, but the, the problem he's talking about is them uh, t- you basically stealing your phone and having an identity theft. Absolutely. No, no, but hold on. So if, if you were to steal my iPhone and it were unlocked, not that it would be, but it were unlocked, I would instantly log into my iCloud account and tell it to wipe the phone. And you can, can do that. that. Um, yeah. You can do the same thing with Android. Android uh, requires you to have a Google account. Mm. And in the Google account, you can go in and do the same thing. Oh. Hey, where's my phone? Hey, play a lock, you know, lock the phone, wipe the storage, whatever. So that's what I would say is like, if you're wow. not familiar with those pages and where they are, um, absolutely get familiar with where's the find my but device. But don't click on, on the wipe my phone. <laughs> no, as a test. <laughs> Yep, hey, it works. I wonder what this button does. Um, and backups. Backups are really important. Oh, yeah, yeah, because you know, if you I'm, back your phone up, you can then get a new iPhone and restore it down. Now, if you do that, and that keeps your authenticators the it does. same. It does. Yep. yep, all of that mm. stuff will be there. So that's where the continuity of authenticators is easy, is if you back your phone up regularly, buy a new phone, and then restore it from the backup, then you don't have to play with that mess that Dwayne talked about, about authentication apps. So that's that's really good. I mean, I never thought about backing up my phone for security purposes. Like, you know, if I had a if I had to restore it, you know, because I want to obviously wipe my phone because it got stolen. That's a really good reason to do that. Sometimes I, I think, you know, when I get that message, hey, your iPhone hasn't been backed up or maybe maybe your iCloud storage yeah. needs to be expanded and you got to pay a couple more dollars. People ignore that. Yep. How do we get a commission on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but honestly, I mean, I, I do the same thing where I'm like, oh, well, it's full. Maybe I'll get rid of some of photos or whatever. But really what suffers is your photos, you know, yeah, some of them might not be backed up, but your phone's not backing up either. And if hmm. the whole phone image isn't backing up, then there's no way for you to restore it back so down. Even if anytime you, you add an, a password to an authenticator, you add some kind of multi-factor authentication to a pa- to an authenticator. Mm-hmm. It's a good idea to go and make sure you do a backup. Yes. Yeah. Yep. That would be a best practice, in my opinion. Now, the other thing is, most sites that you turn on multi-factor authentication will give you emergency codes. Hmm. So, like, if you go to PayPal and say, "Hey, I want to turn on MFA and notify my phone," blah blah blah, whatever. Then they'll say, hey, here's 10 codes that are throwaway codes. They're only one-time use. Keep them in a safe place. So like, I would literally print them out. Don't keep them on your computer. But print them out and put them in a safe. And that way, you know, hey, if you ever get locked out somewhere or your phone gets destroyed, you at least have 10 codes. You can go in and then unlock it and set it to a new phone. So, hmm. But then you have to have thought about security before you needed it. Yeah. And no one does that. No. No one does it. I would recommend this. Everyone listening to this, please, 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 every week, spend 10 minutes thinking about and acting on your own security, whether that's going and setting up a backup or reading, yeah. making sure, or changing a password. Patrick and I even do it in physical security. Like, I'm, I'll be standing at the sink at like the twilight hours at night and I'll shut the light off above the sink and, and my wife will be like, what are you doing? And I say, I'm making it harder for the snipers in the woods. To see and she's like, what is wrong with you? Honestly. Yeah, I know. It, I, 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 I always want to have a clean shot at you, Dwayne. So <laughs> right, you keep right. shutting that damn light off. I only miss once. <laughs> yeah. That's uh, what thermals are for. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On that cheery note. Uh, yeah. Thermals so. are fun. 
<laughs> so now that we've covered those things, there are two Microsoft-related stories. Yes, that's true. Microsoft. It's uh, one of them has to do with Azure, and this is one of the this is one of the first big ones that I've heard of. Uh, no, I've heard of a bunch Azure. of them, but this but is awesome. D- this is this is the fact that DDoSes are getting bigger and bigger. Distributed denial of service attack. So this was a 3.47 terabit per second attack. A- essentially what this company or personal or whatever, whoever the attacker was, got 10,000 sources, in other words, other computers across the world, to just hammer this server that was running on Azure in Asia. And it lasted, what, like 15 minutes or something? Mm, that's about right. Yeah. But this was the biggest one, I think. So was this botnet driven? Yeah. So basically, yeah, t- uh, roughly 10,000 sources across the world. So that means that somebody had a botnet. They had you know, a bunch of cameras or systems right. that are connected to, bot- to band, you know, high bandwidth systems and people sound. So your Aunt Sally and your Uncle Joe might have participated in this attack. And they coordinate them to all like hammer at the, at the target at the same time. And if, you know, they did this to a, a small hosting provider, it would drop. They, they wouldn't be able to keep up typically. But the big providers um, are really getting very good at this. They're learning how to, you know, segregate and using AI to detect um, abusive traffic and, and dropping packets on the first day or sending them into a, uh, a slow response cycle. There's all sorts of ways for them to deal with this. And so we're going to see these headlines keep going up. And one of the reasons that these attacks have escalated is because uh, of the emergence of these uh, distributed denial of service for higher services, which are cheap to acquire. So there's some more career advice for criminals. You know, if you don't want to do the hard work yourself, you can find, uh, you know, a for higher service to bring your competitors to their knees. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. There you go. So I guess this isn't the first one that they've fended off, but it's good to know that Microsoft is uh, is is prepared for it. Yeah, it's um it's impressive. I mean, three point four terabits per second is yeah. that's a lot of bits. A lot that's, of data. Uh, I don't know math wise. I think it's close to almost the Library of Congress every couple of seconds. Wow, and that's a lot of data. So. <sighs> Yeah, it's impressive. There's, uh, they do a good job. All right, and our last story, and I mean that, uh, Lazarus hackers use Windows Update to deploy malware. I so love this one. you thought you were being safe by updating Windows, and boom, malware infection. <laughs> yeah, let me do, and let's dig into that a little bit more. Because listen, as a hacker, I've always tried to manipulate Windows uh, Update because that would be the 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 creme de la creme of deploying malware. If you can be like, oh, I'll just have Windows deploy it for me. So, Dwayne, is this awesome? This is awesome. <laughs> this is awesome. <laughs> so awesome. <laughs> so, what's interesting about this particular type of attack is this actually comes down to a normal phishing attack again. Like okay. somebody gets breached over, you know, sending an email with a link and they click on something or a Word document that was hidden in a zip file that they had to right. click on and open up, whatever. So normal sort of entry point. Um, so here again, advice to the normal user. If you're not expecting something from someone on an email, don't click on it. Um, but if you do, in this particular case, what happens is the malware, the little dropper, um, so sort of malware terminology, when you click on something, usually the thing that runs is not the full like crypto ransomware, whatever. It's just a dropper. It's just a small piece of code that's going to reach out and grab right. data from the internet and run it. Um, in this particular case, that's highly detectable. So if Word goes to reach out to a website and grab data and pull it down and run it, like CrowdStrike and all the other mm-hmm. endpoint detection antivirus goes, whoa, that's weird. Don't do that. Right. But in this particular case, what happens is they modify some settings um, and call some native uh, libraries for Windows Update and have it then go out and download these files. Um, so the, the neat thing about this is how stealthy it is. Mm. Because if you're monitoring that system and you're watching what's going on, it literally looks like Windows Update is busy. It's just pulling stuff down. Um, and you don't really have the understanding that what it is pulling down is malware. Um, that's, you know, that's definitely not to say 
you shouldn't patch. You absolutely should always patch. Um, but it is interesting that if you guys are out there, anybody who is out there who's a blue team or a threat hunter or looking to find yeah. people pulling down malicious software, don't don't exclude Windows Update because you should take a look at where they're pulling down information from as well. So, but the the advice to uh, Joe or Josephine listener is don't worry about it. I would say don't worry about it. I mean, honestly, if you click on something, you shouldn't. Um, chances are there's no, I, I don't think you're running a full security operation center at your house with threat hunters looking at everything. So except Pat, <laughs> yes, <laughs> maybe Patrick. <laughs> so if that's the case, I mean, they're probably not going to take this very stealthy windows updater where route of pulling down software, they're just going to literally download it straight to your computer. Or um, they're going to so, send you an email with a, Hey, you should update your browser. Yeah, the link. exactly. Um, so honestly, Everybody who's listening to this podcast, everybody should always have Windows Updater on. Yeah. Um, I have it always on and tell it to update immediately when patches come down. I don't care if I'm in the middle of a... Hey, yeah. Windows Updater oh, rebooted me. No, good, I'm only kidding. Um, but yeah, joke, I don't care Dwayne. if I'm in the middle of a, like a, a <laughs> web call or whatever. I'd rather it patch my system than me. So <laughs> that said, somebody's going to say, well, sometimes the patches are malevolent. And and it happens occasionally that there's a bug it's or a problem rare. with it is rare. Mm. And if you really want that and you have the discipline, you can wait two days, but don't turn it off and then not run it. It's it's yeah. safer. It's like the people who say, Well, if you wear a seatbelt, you're more likely to get pinned. It's like, no, the statistics show you're let you're safer with the seatbelt. You're safer with auto updates. Uh, so you should just use it. Yeah. Yep. Don't get me started. All You're right. Awesome. Uh, we are calling this show, What If You Lost Your Phone? I like it. There you go. Because I, like I think that. that was a nugget of advice. And we try to give advice on this show, don't we? Yes. Yeah, we do. Yes, we do. Demystifying the mysterious. And by the way, I found a really nice night vision thermal scope. Ooh, very nice. Is this uh, how you give get birthday presents for yourself? Like, it is. Honey. I'm going to buy one of these. I, I have night vision, but I've never had thermal because it was always too expensive. But oh. now it's the price is coming down. Wow. Anyways, on that note. Good. See you guys soon. All right. We'll see you later. Thanks. Nice we'll see you next week. Thanks. Bye.